Well, thank you all for coming. This is a great crowd for uh, an irregularly scheduled uh, UL seminar. This is our last in May. Uh, there's still plenty of seats, Scott, so you can sit down. <laughs> so our speaker today is James Pinto. Uh, James got his bachelor's degree from Cornell in meteorology, stayed in the same field with a master's in Penn State in atmospheric sciences and a PhD from the University of Colorado also in atmospheric and ocean sciences. Uh, after his PhD, he stayed on as a research associate with CU. Um, and working a lot on Arctic data, including uh, data from Sheba, which a lot of us know, uh, working on MM5 modeling, and uh, also working on Aerosan deployments out of Barrow. Uh, following, actually sort of concurrently with that, he visited ATD for, now EOL of course, for several years, and then went on to become a project scientist with RAL, where he's now mostly working on FAA projects, of which I guess you'll tell us more to today. Thanks, James. OK, let's see if this clicks on here. Hello. So I'd like to thank everybody um, and EOL for the opportunity to present uh, my latest race research that I've been working on in, in RAL. Um, this research has been primar primar primarily focused, or sorry, primarily funded by the FAA. Um, they're very interested in understanding how well um, high-resolution numerical weather prediction models can predict the uh, macroscale properties of convection uh, to uh, help them figure out how to route air traffic across the country. And so that's why a lot we've been uh, working on that pretty hard the last few years. Uh, the data that I'll be presenting uh, today um, were provided by MIT Lincoln Labs uh, for the observations uh, that are based on the, the national mosaic, radar mosaic. And the model data uh, that I'm using in the study is from NOAA GSD, so I wanted to acknowledge them up front here for providing the data sets. And then th there are a number of key contributors to this research. Uh, Joe Grimm, who I don't think is here today, um, he's uh, been working for me, um, doing a lot of the analysis that you'll be seeing today. And then uh, Matthias Steiner and David Ahevich uh, have had a lot of fruitful discussions about convection and, and uh, how well it's predicted. And then Dave Albo um, has done a lot of work on the engineering side to create a, a real-time system that can be used to evaluate any kind of model on the fly, and we're currently using it uh, to evaluate the HER and the AFWA uh, multi-model ensemble. So um, I just wanted to kind of provide a brief uh, motivation for this work. Um, in addition to the aviation industry, um, who there have been projections that they lose upwards of $50 million a year due to convective storms, uh, a lot of this is actually mitigatable if they had good forecasts and if they had proactive actions to account for the forecasts. Um, they could eliminate a lot of this cost. It also impacts the uh, air traffic controllers who have a much heavier workload if they start routing traffic uh, into the wrong airspace. And so they're trying to figure out ways to avoid this with better forecasts. And so the lower panel there shows uh, uh, the um, annual cycle of um, air traffic delays for several years um, up through 2005, I believe. And you'll see a big peak there in the summer, and that's associated with uh, convective storms that are uh, poorly forecasted and poorly handled by the aviation uh, planners. Um, agricultural planning is another area uh, that is uh, very interested in the prediction of large-scale con convective storms, and that's because over the Great Plains region, um, a very large percentage of the rainfall falls there at night and falls associated with these larger convective systems. Uh, and a study by uh, Carbone and Tuttle talked about this. And then um, another key area that uh, really requires these um, improved forecasts is for flash flood warnings and, and hazardous weather forecasting. Uh, the, the new initiative by the National Weather Service to do a warn on forecast instead of warning on existing storms really requires very um, accurate measurement or very accurate forecasts of convection. And so here on the right here is a prime example of, of a convective storm with very high impact that happened um, in 2012. And what happened was that you had an initial cell here, um, that, which is actually a remnant of an MCS that formed in Colorado the day before, that reinvigorates and then forms a, into, a, into a derecho over Ohio. Um, predictions for, of this storm weren't very good until that point, up till that point. And so the storm caused a lot of unexpected um, chaos and um, was not expected to even reach into the D.C. area, for example. So 
this is a, a classic case of areas where we need to have better predictions. So the object-based technique really lends itself um, to verifying models because it can be tailored to your specific application. And so I just list a few different uh, applications and listed in an order of uh, increasing time scales in terms of uh, lead time that is needed um, for the application as well as sort of the spatial scales, which are shown there in the table. And it ranges from the flash flooding uh, to ratio type events where um, ideally you'd, uh, you'd have a sort of a, a warning lead time of up to four hours if you can. And you very small errors, so distance errors on the order of 10 kilometers, especially for flash flood warnings, are, are required. And so in an object-based technique, you can actually set parameters that allow you to say, okay, we want to see how well we do if we, if we um, look at storms that are um, trying to have errors less than 10 kilometers, for example. Um, each of these applications also has different requirements. Uh, for example, flash flood forecasting, they're going to want to know something about the duration and the intensity, whereas aviation planning is really going to care more, not so much about the placement of the storms, but more about how, how large they're going to be, um, are there going to be any gaps, and what's their orientation relative to the national airspace and their plans for that day. Then if you go to a little bit longer time scales, um, for example, utility, utility company planning, um, have a lot of uh, interest in, in longer scale forecasts of larger scale storm systems. A, because they can have a significant impact on the power supply, and so they want to have uh, a capability to position assets ahead of the storm, for example, so that they can have a faster response time. Here's an example of the impact of a deratio event where it basically clobbered the utility poles and the number of uh, utility trucks working there to try to repair the damage. And then finally, um, the water resource planning, and I put months to years there. This is sort of more on the climate timescales, um, where you're, you're perhaps looking at um, climate model results or um, uh, seasonal forecasts. And there, the, the placement error isn't quite as critical, um, although you may want to know like which basin the precipitation is going to fall in. Uh, and t typically, what we look at is frequency maps, so how, how likely is it that there's going to be a storm? Uh, impacting a certain area, and how does this change if, if, if climate's changing, for example? James, where do you get these numbers? Where do they come from? Um, off the top of my head. <laughs> they're, ballpark, they're ballpark numbers. So, so again, as I mentioned, they kind of lend themselves to an object-based approach where you're looking at the macro-scale properties of the storm rather than focusing on pixel, pixels in the model versus pixels in the observations. And so the goals of my research are, um, that I'm going to present today, anyway, are to evaluate the uh, characteristics of large-scale convective storms predicted by a high-resolution, what we call a convection-permitting model, because you're not fully resolving the convection, but it does allow the storms to grow and grow up scale, um, using an object-based approach. And some of the properties that I'll look at today include the storm frequency, so we're looking at longer-term periods over the course of a couple of summers, and looking at the timing and especially focusing on the initiation of these storms. And um, to a lesser extent, we look, also look at some of the, the uh, size distributions and aspect ratios of the storms. And then once we've established the model biases, we want to look and see what are the cause for these biases. And this is an important step, especially when you're trying to provide feedback to model developers. You can't just give them a, a skill score and say, hey, your model is no good. They really want to know, well, what are you seeing? What's wrong with the model? What aspects are, are, are having problems? And the other aspect of this is um, to inform uh, instrumentation needs for future field experiments, for example. So if you see that there's a consistent model bias in the stability profile, for example, then you'll, you'll know that you can uh, target certain observations to try to improve upon that. OK, so what is an object-based verification technique? So this is a um, figure that I took from a paper by Davis et al., um, showing, doing this a really nice comparison of what the pros and cons are of the two different techniques. Now, standard skill scores like the CSI, which is, um, I showed the equation there, it's basically the number of hits divided by the hits plus the errors, which are the misses and the false alarms. And it's typically pixel based, although you can upscale and make the pixels very large if you want. But um, there's no information about the properties of the storms, for example, the size, the orientation, the aspect ratio, or the uh, duration. And so um, if you look at these different uh, slides, the green blob, uh, little circle is the observed field in the idealized sense, and then the different magenta colors are the different forecast representations uh, with the same observation. 
And so if you look at the equitable threat score, which is a, a skill, standard skill score, very similar to CSI, you see that for these images, the, the, the score is the same. It's, it's non-discriminatory. It doesn't tell you that this forecast is any better than this forecast or any better than this forecast. When clearly, to the eye, this forecast seems to be superior to the others that are shown here. And especially depending on your application. For example, for aviation, this is actually a really good forecast. Um, for um, flash flooding, it may not be so good. And so your criteria can be adjusted. Um, one of the pros of the object-based technique is that uh, it's defined by an, what they call an interest um, value. And the interest value can be a function of a number of different aspects of the storm. Here I just kind of list a few in terms of the distance error, so the offset of the centroid distances, for example, the size of the storm, um, timing, orientation, whatever the application is interested in. So that's another nice aspect of object-based technique is you can tailor the skill score to what meets the application's uh, requirements. Um, the other thing about the object-based technique is that it doesn't give you this double penalty score that happens with standard skill scores. So for, let's go back to this case again. Um, if you use the standard skill score, the, it's not only a miss, but it's also a false alarm. And so it's a double negative in that equation over there. And so your forecast looks even worse than it is. So those are some examples. There's been a lot of work using object-based techniques um, in the past, say, 10 years or so. And RAL has a, um, an actual um, module that you can take off offline called Mode that has an object-based um, component to it. And that was what Chris Davis used in his, a lot of his research. Um, and so I'm going to show an example of that. This was sort of an initial application of that. Um, back in 2006 paper, where he applied the technique to look at wharf high resolution runs. And what he found was that the model tended to over forecast the number of large storms. And so they, they hypothesized that it might have been uh, due to um, resolution not being able to resolve the circulations. And it may have also been due to um, the model having um, too much diffusion in it. Um, Another thing they found is shown over here, and this is the timing of the storms. And so what they found was that, um, and here, sorry, here's the domain here where they were evaluating the model. Um, and so the timing here is shown bet uh, between zero and two hours offset um, between the average time of the observed minus, or the absolute value of the, ab the time of the observed storm versus the model. And at night, they saw that there was a very large timing error in the model, and they related that to the model's inability to capture um, the large, um, elevated convection at night, especially with initiation. We have question? a question. A question on your absolute error. You're showing absolute error, so does that cross the axis at times? Like, how, I mean, it looks like it could be easily three, three hours off. Um, it's, I don't know the magnitude of those high points. Yeah, so this is, this is the uh, absolute error as a function of time of day. And so one of the things I didn't mention was they had a limit when they were matching the objects. They had a limit that they had to have at least, the average had to be within three hours, otherwise it wasn't even included. So the max it could be would be three. And in these cases, they end up being on the order of between one and two hours off in timing. During the day, there wasn't as much of an issue because of the, the, they, they hypothesized that the diurnal forcing um, was, was well captured in the model and was able to generate the convection with, with reasonable timing. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. So yeah. That, that's the thing that would, that's confusing. Yeah, I agree. It's yeah. So it's an absolute value here. So there's three hour time frame there that is covered by a one point five hour. True. True. And and some of the errors here, they mentioned that some of the errors here were compensating, so it averaged out to be zero. In the during the daytime. Do you know how whether how whether they were? They, to be they don't say, they don't say in that paper. Yeah. So I don't know. I do have some other studies that should talk about that. Um, so we developed a, a technique based on Titan um, that is uh, a little bit simpler than Mode, um, which is the, the, the technique that's available um, from the RAL group, uh, RAL verification group. Um, and so what we do is we first uh, smooth the field out a little bit, and then we apply a threshold. And, and here we're using VIL because that's typically what um, aviation uses to detect storms. And the other parameter that's aviation specific is gaps. Um, we, um, and we, we permit gaps larger than 10 kilometers between uh, convective areas. Um, 
And here, convective areas are again defined by the 3.5 uh, value for VIL, which is about 40 dBZ. Um, and then for it to be a large scale storm, it has to have a maximum dimension exceeding 100 kilometers. And the lifetime of the storm has to exceed one, be at least one hour or more. And so when we apply that, this is just an example image. Um, the, red, the red boxes are, are objects that were identified by Titan. And those are at the present time. And so the next thing we did was we wanted to assess which, ones, which of these objects were initiation events. And so to do that, we have two search radiuses, um, one in time and one in space. And the one in space is given by the blue ellipses. And so we search around the, around the <coughs> exist, currently existing storms and see if there's any other storms nearby um, at times in the past. And we look one and two hours into the past to see if there are any previously existing storms. And so that's what the blue and the magenta colors are, the previously existing storms one and two hours into the past. And so if you look at the, look at the different contours, you see that um, object number five um, was well within these two ob previous objects, so that's not initiation. Same thing for four. Um, one and two, however, are new. There are no previously existing storms within those um, search within the 125 kilometer search radius. Um, the only other one that's an odd case is this item three. It was classified as a previously existing storm because its search radius was within two hours of this previously existing storm. And so that one was um, not inadvertently not classified as an initiation event. However, um, we did a, a, a long time period where we did hand uh, tune to make sure that this technique was picking most of the initiation events. And we found that it actually captures about 95% of the events. So this is just um, happens to be one example where it's, it's, it's not working quite right, but it works pretty well. So the, the red just highlights which storms were classified as initiation events. So I want to point out here too, this was a uh, common distinction that we had to make early on, is that when we say large scale convection, we're not just referring to MCSs. Um, it's an all encompassing um, terminology that we employ just to kind of show that it's, we're looking at all different types of convective storms, which is what the aviation industry cares about. They don't care if it's an MCS or not, for example. And so we have squall lines also that are, this is a very long squall line that is captured as a single large scale storm. And then clusters of storms that you commonly see in the southeast are also classified as, as large scale storms. Just a brief comment on the data set. Uh, this was provided by MIT Lincoln Labs as part of our um, collaboration uh, to produce a short-term forecasting system for the FAA. Um, it's, it's from this system called the Corridor Integrated Weather System, or CWIS. And it's, it actually updates every five minutes and it has a very high resolution of one kilometer and it updates every five minutes. We subset this to hourly to do our analyses. So here's an example of applying this to a, a ratio event um, that occurred last uh, in 2012. And so what you'll see is the white contours are identifications of the large scale storms. And then every time you see a red flash, that's an indication of an initiation event. And so as you, if you watch through this movie loop, you'll see um, there's several initiation events. In fact, eight altogether, I believe. And then typically what we, fee what we find when we do a roll up of the, of the statistics is that about the number of initiation of events is about a factor of 10 fewer than the number of actual large scale storm events. So there's probably roughly about 80 um, large scale storm occurrences within this loop. So what we do then is we apply this technique over the entire summer. And here's just uh, the past two summers worth of data where we did this. And I've broken it down into daytime and nighttime on the left and right, and then 2012 and 2013 the top and bottom. And what's shown is the, the frequency of occurrence of a large scale storm um, and, the, and the numbers are per week, uh, number per week. And so what jumps out at you right away is the large maximum uh, in the southeastern United States. So what you're getting is these clusters of storms coming together and exceeding 100 kilometers in, in dimension um, day in and day out, um, you know, approaching six, six um, times per week. So it could happen multiple times per day, for instance, in those regions. And then at night, you see um, quite a different pattern. Um, in 2012, relatively few events were detected with just a little bit of a maxima over Kansas here. Um, this was a very atypical, if you remember back to 2012, it was a very atypical season. Um, a very dry, a large drought over much, much of the central US. And 
the cause of that is likely the fact that there just weren't any of these larger scale storm systems. In 2012, we go back to um, sort of a more typical pattern. You see there's a large maximum right over the center of the country, and that extends to the east there. Um, and then a couple other smaller scale features in there as well. But, but these maps highlight the importance of, or, or the interannual variability of these large scale systems. Now, if we look at the CI, um, this gives us sort of a different picture. On the left is the frequency of occurrence of the CI events. And here we're, we're actually searching over, for each grid point that we have plotted there, we're searching over a 500 kilometer um, area because the CI events are much, much less common, as I mentioned earlier. And so in 2012, you see um, a very big difference from 2013 in the observations in the high plains. So 2012 was relatively devoid of these initiation events, whereas 2013 had a nice bullseye right over um, eastern Colorado, western Kansas, western Nebraska. On the right here, I have the timing of the storms. Uh, so when did the, the, the median time that the uh, storms initiated, and they're typically around, um, I think it's about 18 to 19 UTC. So in the late evening, um, sorry, late afternoon, early evening time period. So other things you'll p pick out on this is the, again, the big peaks there in the southeast. And that kind of varied too between the two seasons. In tw 2012, you see you get this sort of bimodal appearance in the initiation events. And then in 2013, it's more consolidated over Florida. And timing is uh, much earlier. So along the Gulf Coast, you get a very early timing of these larger scale systems um, occurring in the late morning time frame. So if we look at 2013, this was a more typical year. Um, you see uh, we had initiation events of these larger scale systems on the high plains, um, roughly around 1920 local standard time. And then the propagation of these storms eastward uh, show up really nicely in the, the nighttime um, period between 8 p.m. and 11 a.m. This is very similar to the um, work that was pr um, given in uh, this was, uh, Carbone and, and Tuttle 2008, showing the same type of thing where the, you had this narrow zone of initiation over the high plains over there, and then the propagation of storms uh, to the east. And then they also noticed a little bit of a secondary maximum here with this nighttime um, convection initiating their um, pro primarily elevated convection. You also see a very strong diurnal cycle um, in the eastern part of the domain, which is very similar to what we found in our maps. So that's sort of an intro to the, the technique and how it was applied to um, diagnose the, the climatology of the observations in terms of large-scale storms. The next thing we did is apply it to a high-resolution model. And so here's a description of the model. I don't want to get into too much detail. Um, other than to say it, um, it runs every hour, uh, runs throughout the year, and we're primarily focusing on the summer months. Um, three kilometer resolution, so rapidly updating, um, high resolution convection permitting run. They use the latest version of WARF, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, and, they, and the other important aspect is that it assimilates the radar reflectivity data. And it does this through what they call latent heat nudging, where they they see in the, in the 3D volumes of reflectivity where the, where the um, precip size particles are, and then they convert that to a latent heat to nudge the model to have the storms in the same location. A full description you can find there on the website. They don't, they don't have any recent publications, um, but uh, that's a really nice description there on the bottom if you're, if you're interested. The problem with this model is that it changes every year. And so between 2012 and 2013, they had multiple upgrades, um, including changing the WARF version, changing the um, shortwave radiation, PBL scheme, land surface model. Um, but the biggest change, in my opinion, was that they went from assimilating the radar reflectivity direct, uh, into the 13-kilometer uh, parent model of the HER to directly assimilating it into the, into the HER itself, so into the 3-kilometer model. And that, I think, it probably had, a, uh, as you'll see, a big uh, impact on the, and the results. Now, the one thing we found early on was that we couldn't just directly apply the VIL threshold to the model data because the, reflect, the, the VIL data, which is derived from the microphysics and reflectivity code, had a significant um, low bias. And so if we applied the same uh, threshold as we did to the observations, we would get very low biases in the forecasted number of large-scale storms. 
And so in order to mitigate this, we developed a, a, a technique to mitigate this. Uh, this is just showing an example of the biases that we would get if we used the 3.5 threshold um, in terms of the size distribution on the top panel. The observed is the black line with connected dots, and then the forecast is given by the different colors. Those are different lead times. But they're all pretty much clustered on one, one another, and they all grossly underestimate the size of the storm. In addition, the aspect ratio is also um, not optimal um, in the model. And then what, what we were finding was that the storms tended to be too linear. So they were too small and too linear in nature. The technique to be developed looks at trying to pick a threshold that optimizes the um, derived number of large-scale storms from the model in terms of both the number and in terms of the size distribution. So what we did here is we used a bunch of different thresholds using a short time period of the data and then found which threshold best matched for all lead times. And so what we found was in, in 2012, a threshold of about 1.5, which is this orange curve here, um, matched pretty well up to about 8 to 10 hours, which is the time period that we were interested in in terms of the number concentration, but sorry, the number of storms. And in terms of maximum dimension, it's hard to see, but it, you can, it really matched, this is the orange line here, really matched the observed size distribution really well. So we figured that was probably a good place to start. Um, this technique, I should mention, um, actually matches techniques that are used to do calibration of uh, probabilistic forecast as well. It's a simple technique to do that. And so after doing this, now we compare the left panel with the right panel. We see that we get a, a size distribution. Um, and now this is for the entire summer of data. That really matches the observed size distribution um, nicely from the model. And the, only at probably, I'd say, a limited expense of the aspect ratio. So what tends to happen is if you choose a lower threshold, um, you can imagine a storm with concentric um, intensities around it. Uh, the storm ends up being a little bit more circular. And so that's what happens. We end up having the model um, having a peak that's a bit greater than the observed um, on the low end of the aspect ratio, so more circular storms. But that's OK. There, the, overall, the trade-off is about equal because the model before was having the storms too linear. And we're not really interested in that in the study. And so here's a comparison now of the uh, observed and model forecast. And we picked the six-hour forecast because that's what the threshold was optimized for. And so the left panel just shows the observations for reference. And the right panel shows the, the model bias in terms of frequency bias, forecast minus observed. So everywhere you see the red colors, that's where the model was over forecasting. And everywhere you see the blue colors, that's where the model was under forecasting. And so a couple of patterns might jump out at you quickly. Um, you now, the all times, you see that for all times of day, there's a pretty significant high bias in the modeled number of storms in the high plains. And you see this also here in the lower Mississippi River Valley and, and southern Florida. And if you look at the breakdown between day and night, the, um, this high bias comes from the nighttime storm. So the, for, the model's predicting too many um, storms in the high plains, the northern high plains. And that sort of extends down into the southern plains as well. Uh, the other thing that really jumps out at you, too, is this, this negative uh, bias here in the southeast, indicating the models under forecasting the number of large storms in the southeast. So basically, two pretty significant biases pop out at you right away in 2012. If we look at 2013, you see it had a much different climatology, especially at night. But the biases were the same. So you still have a high bias in the high plains. Um, maybe perhaps extending further south into the area where the dry line is, is typically present. And you see that extend at night and in day in 2013. And you also see the, um, the low bias in the southeast is consistent too. So even though they made all these model changes, um, you still have similar biases, at least uh, this clim uh, climate time scale is uh, wrapped up over the entire summer. So we wanted to know, well, are these, how do these manifest themselves when you actually match the objects? And so that's what we did here. And so I'm comparing 2012 to 2013. Um, again, the left, in 2012, they only did assimilation into the 13 kilometer model, the radar reflectivity assimilation. Whereas in 2013, they added it to the three kilometer as well. And so our matching criteria are pretty simple. 
Um, basically, if the model was, in 50, was within 50 kilometers of the observed large-scale storm, it was considered a hit. If there were no model forecast within 50 kilometers of the observations, it was considered a miss. And then if no observations were within 50 kilometers of the model, it was considered a false alarm. And so then we computed a couple of the standard skill, store, skill scores. Um, top one here is CSI. And so this is one where you can kind of see a difference in the, in the performance of the two models with a pretty significant bump up of the skill at night, for the nighttime period in 2013. And so we believe this is related to the assimilation of uh, the radar reflectivity data into the three kilometer grid. Um, this pickup in skill was, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> Just bang it. Uh, it was attributable to both uh, an increase in the number of uh, PODs, so it had more hits, basically, and the number of false alarms decreased. So in both aspects, uh, the model performance improved in this region. Okay. Yeah. Quick question. Were you using all um, B times for this, or specifically? Yeah, sorry, I should have pointed this out. So um, so we have time of day along the, the x-axis and, and then lead time on the, on the y-axis. So. Yeah, for all lead times, you're really seeing a pickup, even out to the longer, out beyond 10 hours lead times. Do you, do you trust lead times less than two or three hours? Um, because the model is sort of going for a spin up day. Good point, yeah. In 20. You sort of see that in terms of you know, the hits varies yeah. um, early on, and then it fades away rather quickly. Yeah, you get your hits early on, especially when there's previously existing storms there. And in 2012, there was a bit more of a spin-up because they were only assimilating into the 13 kilometer. Whereas in 2013, within about an hour, the model pretty much had the storm where it was going to put it in, in terms of the assimilation. So that's not really included in this, in this figure. So I cut out hour one. So what, what's the cause of the, this, um, these, this high bias? So what we did was we looked at 2013, um, comparing the observed initiations with the forecasted initiations. And here I'm just looking at the six-hour forecast on the, on the left there. And so what you see is the area over which the, the initiation events occurred was much larger in the model than, than were observed. And so that looks like it's part of the cause is that you're initiating too many large storms in the model. In the southeast, you have the opposite effect. You see we're comparing the lower panel with the upper panel. Um, you have way too few initiation events in the southeast. And so, again, that corresponds directly with the, the low bias that we were seeing there. So it's an initiation event that's causing these biases uh, for the most part, it seems like. The other thing that we noticed was that in the timing of the storms, and I think this answers a, well, it kind of gets back to that Davis paper. Um, what we were seeing is that the, observa uh, the model was initiating storms too early. On, on, on the order of about two to three hours too early in the high plains, um, and potentially also too early in the southeast when it did initiate storms. Although, as I mentioned, they had a pretty significant low bias there. These results are sort of backed up by a recent paper by Burkhardt et al., who looked at initiation events, and they were focusing, they were looking at all scales, not just large scales, but it's still very relevant um, in the high plains area. And so the red curve there is. They're high very high resolution, 400 meter model runs over this domain. And they, sh they, sh they saw that they had an um, early start time to a lot of the storms, and they over tended to over forecast the, the start of the storms. So this leads me to believe that it, it's probably not to the fact that the HER has these same biases may not be related to the fact that it can't really resolve the terrain, since in this case the terrain is really well resolved and it still has the similar biases. So, you know, given these biases, what we'd like to do next is then com composite the uh, cases, um, looking at false alarms, for example, compositing all the cases together and looking at the environmental conditions in the model and comparing that with observations. And so I just, we're just starting to get into this. And so here's an example of uh, the false alarm cases in the, in the high plains. This is an initiation event that occurred last summer. And we noticed about 25 cases like this in 2013, where um, the forecast, which is in these uh, color contours, uh, showed a very large, well-defined system. Um, and remember, this, has a, this is the raw vill field, so this actually has a, a cold bias in it. So th this is a pretty good-looking, pretty good hefty storm. 
Whereas the observations, um, you see these little tiny co contours, just basically had a little bit of um, small scale convective storms that never developed. And so we see this type of case a number of times last summer. And uh, the question is, you know, how, how, what's causing this? What, what, what environmental parameters is the model having problems with? Um, I'll note that one of the issues is that typically what happens is we, we have to go back to the um, operational sounding network, which only has sounding twice a day at, at 0 and 12Z, and they're pretty widely spaced. So I have two of the sounding sites um, on there, Denver and, and um, Earth Platte, Nebraska. And this storm just happened to form right between the two of them, of course. So um, the representativeness of the soundings is going to be a little bit in question. Um, but here's uh, a little bit of analysis looking at this particular case. And so what I'm showing here is on the, on the left, we have the surface-based cape. Um, and this is a valid at 17 UTC. And on the right, we have the surface-based SIN. And I've, I've noted in the, we're in the model, the model initiated a storm that didn't occur. And you'll see that the CAPE values here are really high. They're probably on the order of between two and 3,000, which, which is a hefty amount of CAPE with very little SIN shown here on the right. They're um, between, between zero and minus 50. The, the other thing you'll notice here, I have the surface pra pressure pattern in white, and then the wind barbs there, surface winds are, are, are shown. And what you'll see is there's an area of convergence uh, right in here. Um, very close to where the storms actually initiated. And so the model um, had a convergence zone and it had high cape and low sin. And so of course it's gonna erupt um, a pretty good sized convective uh, squall line. On the bottom there I have uh, soundings from the two uh, nearest locations. And this is at zero Z, so they're the closest in, in time to 17 UTC that I had. But I think they're pretty representative because this is pretty much the, the peak cape probably for the day. And on the left there in Denver, um, we only got up to about 150, which is about probably what it is there, um, pretty low. Um, but on the right, in um, North Platte, Nebraska, we're only at about 550, whereas in the, in the model, it's over, over 1,000 there. So the model stability was, was definitely off in this case. In addition, I, don't ha I didn't have the slide here available, but the, um, the analysis from the same model showed that there wasn't any or very strong convergence that you're seeing there. So it had basically two errors in this case. Um, it had convergence area that wasn't there and it had too much instability. So I wanted to talk a little bit about observational needs um, since um, this is a EOL seminar. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, operational soundings for verification are often too far from the area of interest in both distance and time. And to some extent, I think this probably hinders that comparison um, that I just showed. Um, but you know, what can we do about this? We have field experiments, and this presentation is, is, is kind of leading toward what's, what's coming up next, which is PECON, which is a, the Plains Elevated Convection at Night um, field program that's going to actually study the um, initiation and, and maintenance of high plains uh, thunderstorms. Um, and I think they're going to have a focus on the all scales of storms, although most interested in, in the larger scale systems. So what we really need is uh, improved initial conditions, uh, especially for predicting CI. Um, as I said, the, the model has radar data simulation. So if there's an existing storm, it, it'll assimilate that in, and you'll, you'll get a pretty good projection. And you see that we saw that there were much improvement when they assimilated it directly into the three-kilometer model. But when there's no initiation, or sorry, when there's no convection currently there, um, we need other measurements, and we need them in. Uh, good time evolution, as well as spatial coverage um, in terms of both the stability, both at the surface and aloft, and the shear and low-level convergence. And this is work that uh, EOL is working toward, I know. And, and PECON will try to address these issues, which I'm excited to see. Um, another aspect that gets overlooked sometimes is surface moisture and cloud cover. If an area is expected to have high cape, for example, but a cloud shield forms and, 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 and prevents the solar radiation from getting in there, you can actually kill, uh, kill the initiation of a storm. And so that information also needs to be available. And finally, other considerations are we need the measurements to be fairly accurate and representative of the environment. Oh, did I skip one? So I mentioned PECON. Um, 
this is an experiment that's very timely, um, considering that we're finding the biases in the model are, are fairly extreme in the high plains and, and great plains. And so this field campaign is uh, designed to capture just that, to the initiation of, of MCSs, and as well as their maintenance through the, their dynamics and coupling with the microphysics, and then mechanism, possible mechanisms for the initiation of these storms are through borers and other um, elevated sources of convergence. And so they have a, a very complex field experiment where they're going to have mobile platforms um, racing around trying to get in position uh, prior to a storm passing through an area. They'll have uh, mobile, mobile radar, mobile soundings, uh, mobile mesal net. Um, the logistics, logistics of this experiment are mind-boggling. Um, and so I think it's going gonna, it's it's gonna to be a great opportunity uh, to collect data that is going to help shed some light on these uh, biases that we're finding. But it's also pointing to the fact that, well, we're going to have this uh, data set, but what happens when we go back to the operational world and we don't have these types of measurements? So uh, let's think about that a little bit. <laughs> um, so some of the highlights uh, I've so shown today, um, we have seen some skill improvements in the, in the high-resolution model over the past couple of years. Uh, some of it is related to the post-processing technique um, in order to remove that first-order biases. And we've also seen additional skill pickup due to um, the changes that were made to the model between 2012 and 2013, um, which we believe are primarily due to the assimilation of the uh, radar reflectivity, but could be others as well. Um, it's hard to sort them out all, all out since there were so many changes. But that could also be due to changes in the environment. As I showed, 2012 was a lot different year than 2013. 2013 had a lot more storms, and so just by pure coincidence, you could have um, you have a better chance of having more hits. Um, so there's that factor as well that needs to be sorted out. And as I mentioned, there's two key biases that remain: uh, the overprediction of large-scale systems over the high plains and great plains, especially at night. Um, and I've shown that the initiation is too early and too often. Um, and especially in the northern high plains in 2013. I didn't mention this, but we feel that it's possible that the dissipation may also be too slow, and this is something that we're, we're looking at now. And then the other point is that in the southeast, um, storms are grossly underestimated. And this is, again, due to the um, treatment of CI in the model being poorly handled, um, perhaps due to the fact that it's not being able to handle the upscale growth of um, these storm clusters in a, a weakly forest environment. Opportunities. So, my point here is that we, in order to really get at this problem, we're going to need to have um, observations, targeted observations. And I think the pecan field experiment is going to be a great first um, approach to this to be able to understand what's going on. But we're probably going to need other uh, and this um, techniques to observe the lower atmosphere to, to see, you know, where these areas of converge, low-level convergence are or mid-level convergence, and um, what the stability profile is doing, how is it changing with time. And so it's just some ideas I'm throwing out there, uh, and some of these may have been thought of before, but um, perhaps there's some way to develop a distributed array of automated, automated launch sites for soundings with very small balloons and mini sounds that can be um, strategically positioned um, throughout the Midwest. Um, another option would be to have balloon-borne mini drop signs where Instead of just having one up sign, you have an up sign, and then you have a, the, the sounding drop, many drop signs as it goes along. And then finally, UAVs to target areas that are expected to have initiation, but don't know exactly where or exactly when they could be flown out. Um, but these would have to be rather inexpensive to do, at least in an operational sense. Um, I think that potentially, you know, working EOL working with RA, um, CU um, through RAF to establish. Re, um, contacts there and collaborations with them and their UAV department would be a, an interesting way to go, especially in terms of um, adding capabilities to the deployment pool. Secondly, I think uh, routine coupling of observations with numerical weather prediction, high resolution models, um, this helps in a number of ways. Just a couple of points here, um, pre-planning pre for field work, um, this was done a lot with PECON where different um, types of different models were assessed um, to figure out uh, where they're failing, um, and uh, as well as looking at observations and saying, well, where are the convective storms most likely to form? That's how they determined uh, where they were going to cite the field program. And then um, 
The other point is that the modeling places observations from a field experiment to a larger context in terms of both time and space. So you can extend observations that are made for ex during a field experiment to other time periods. And then finally, process studies. And this is sort of what we're looking at now in terms of compositing the model forecasts that were busts in terms of either false alarms or misses and um, trying to find consistent biases in the model environmental fields like convergence and CAPE and other fields that are impacting the formation of these storms. Thank you, and I'll stop there. Any questions? Questions for James? Yeah, this is a very good talk, actually. Um, I was wondering, have to what extent do you feel like some of these misses or these this um, under or sorry over under prediction over the southeast? was or can be due to um, surface heterogeneity not being captured in the model. Somehow these really smaller scale patches of like open field plus forest and then open field forest, sort of these things that the model at three kilometers certainly he's not going to be able to capture. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, they, do, they do keep trying to improve their land surface model, but they're, the one thing that I think it's limited there is the feedbacks between um, previous days worth of precipitation getting into the soil moisture and then perhaps preconditioning the environment for the next day. So that could play a role. Um, and then also I think it just has problems because of the diffusion coefficients that they use. The problems have, the storms have problems um, coming together. They tend to want to stay apart to some extent. So it could be something related to that too. I think it's requiring some really high resolution simulations right. to see what's going on there. But that was a good point. I kind of like this idea you had about these uh, little mini soundings you can automatically send up. Were you thinking about this as like with a front experiment or a special experiment or operationally? And do you have any idea what that might cost? <laughs> well, I, I've always I've always been taught that you don't throw any ideas out until you figure out how much things cost. <laughs> but um, I, th I think it's out there. I think you know if, if we were going to try to look at doing this type of thing. Um, Initially, you would want to do it in a test bed type setting, um, but ultimately, I think you know you're looking a number of years down the road. It could become some kind of an operational transformation from doing these, you know, zero Z and twelve Z soundings every day, which are at terrible times for predicting CI, to more of a targeted sounding approach. So I think it, you know, that would be a, the progression that would be, could be possible, but who knows how much it costs? That's why I said mini mini balloons. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how. We really need to go up maybe to 500 millibars. Yeah. Go yeah. I guess we have to use the mic. Um, so, so my question revolves around. I know within. I'm not completely connected with the modeling community at all. I mean, I need kind of glance what you guys are doing in presentations and I know very little about it but mm -hmm. I have seen a bit more in the realm of um, extremely high resolution uh, both vertical and uh, horizontal kind of scales and different modeling type of capabilities kind of given with new uh, computational um, improvements. Mm -hmm. Has there been any kind of effort to kind of be able to integrate these uh, like off-wall non-sounding um, uh, fixed location sites to kind of get information. Like you had a slide there about uh, Denver and uh, I don't remember what the site yeah, was in Nebraska. Yeah, and and this, the, the storm you're talking about is right in the middle of it. Right. And uh, given some of the airport, uh, I mean, you would know, uh, airplane platforms we've got, we can basically kind of aim in between somewhat. Right. Um, but is there any kind of way to ingest that data into the, into the model hierarchy mm -hmm. that are being developed? Yeah, Have you, has that sure. kind of been researched? Yeah, so they, the model that I showed, I didn't have time to mention all the data sets they assimilate, but it actually includes uh, data from um, commercial aircraft upsounds and when they ascend and, and climb um, at airports. But if you don't have any airports nearby, that you don't have that information either. But so some, in some cases, especially in the Midwest where their airports are few and far between, you need to have a, some other capability to, to get soundings in that area if you want to accurately depict these initiation events, I think. But in terms of the high res that you mentioned, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly 
what you were getting at, but there are studies to have looked at different resolutions going all the way down to you know tens of kilometers, like LES type simulations, to figure out you know what scale do you have to um, model at in order to resolve everything. And so it's it's down there in the you know tens to hundreds of tens to hundreds of meters to, in order to resolve everything. So we're a far we're a long way from that as well on the modeling side. This is slightly parenthetical, but I can't uh, can't help asking since both your qualifications and your point at the end, we'll be talking in EOL about trying to form a strategy for what we should be doing with UAVs mm -hmm. or how we should help. And do you have anything, any advice to, to give us in that realm? Yeah, well, um, in my exp I had, as you know, I had some experience with UAVs a, a while back. And our biggest limitation was dealing with the FAA, actually. So <laughs> that's the biggest hurdle. I think, I think having, a, you know, having that as a, a, as a platform in your arsenal, especially uh, if you can get something like that, that you could have as part of the deployment pool, would be a, a, a nice addition. Um, it's a lot, it can be a lot cheaper than a, a major aircraft, especially if you only need a few different types of measurements for the smaller UAVs that you might want to fly. That, um, the ones that I'm experienced with are the expendable Aerosond, I mean, they're not exactly expendable. But <laughs> they're not the global hawk, you know, you don't want to lose that puppy. But <laughs> but you could send the other UAVs into more harsh environments and, and you know, sometimes they don't come back. But um, those types of measurements would be really useful if you could target them in a, in a, in a general area. But the, there's also all, all sorts of trade-offs, like the, the Aerosonds, for example, they, had, they were pretty slow flying, so you couldn't go that far um, oh, a field to get measurements. But if you had a specific area that you were interested in as part of a deployment, I think they would work pretty well. What kind of payload do they carry? Just like a, a ballpark, um, I think on the order of 10 to 15 kilograms-ish for the aerosign. But the, you know, the bigger they are, the, the more they can carry. So. Well, if there are no more questions, I think we'll thank James again. Thank you.